At the end of our last section, in verse 12 of chapter 9, we were warned that there was still more trouble to come. But remember, throughout Revelation, the Lamb, Jesus, is on the throne, so there's no need to doubt the outcome of the story. This next section does appear a bit complicated, it's true. Verses 13 to 19 of chapter 9 seem to have creatures that would fit right into a Care of Magical Creatures class at Hogwarts. Then there's a big angel and a little scroll in chapter 10, and at that point you might be ready to wave the white flag and say, do you know what, I give up. But please don't, don't despair. As the sixth trumpet sounds, a horrifying, powerful cavalry charge begins. It's nightmarish as these vicious horses and their riders, far more terrifying even than the ring wraiths in the Lord of the Rings, are unleashed. But who are they? As ever with the book of Revelation, there are loads of different suggestions. The one I think is correct, that fits most well with the rest of the Bible, is that they are demonic forces of destruction. Yes, they are vicious and they are destructive. But look at what else is true of them. They're on a leash. They can only reach as far as God allows them to reach. God sets the limits on their activity, on when they start, when they stop, and what they can do. So while sometimes it might look in our world as if Satan is in control, he's not. The vicar at the church where I grew up used to liken Satan to a snake with its neck broken. It was still vicious, it could still thrash about, and if you got in the way of its fangs, you would still get poisoned, but it couldn't move very far, and it was going to die. Satan is a dangerous enemy, but he's a defeated one. Then in verses 20 to 21, we get some of the saddest verses so far in the chapter, almost more terrifying than the ones before, really. Because even after all of this, some people still didn't turn away from wrong and turn to God. So what will it take? Idolatry isn't just about statues made of gold, silver, bronze, stone of wood and wood. It can be about the God of the stock markets, which many people think will save us, or the God of fame, or sexual freedom. We've all been made to worship. It's hardwired into us. The question is, who or what will we worship? Revelation 9 urges us to choose God and worship him only. Then there's that big angel in Revelation 10. The focus isn't so much on him as on what he's holding, the little scroll. It contains all the words of God and John is asked to eat it. Like the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, when he does, it turns his stomach, though it tastes sweet. Telling the bittersweet truth of the gospel won't always be easy. The bitterness of our sin and our complete inability to please God on our own will put lots of people off, and we might be tempted not to mention it. But we must, because without it, people won't be able to appreciate the sweetness of God's amazing grace.